Thank you everyone for joining Data Theorem's webinar series. Today's topic is serverless versus containers, a case study of building a real world microservice. Now before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit about Data Theorem with everyone. The company was founded in 2013 in the heart of Silicon Valley and is headquartered in Palo Alto, California. We also now have offices in both Paris and New York. Each of our leaders has have over 15 years in the cybersecurity industry and have published six security research books and led over four billion in US security acquisitions. That has given us the great privilege to work with a number of great customers and be a part of their mobile AppSec and API security programs. Now, before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to say that we will reserve time at the end for Q&A, so please put your questions in the Q&A panel and we'll be sure to address those at the end. With that, I'd like to introduce Alvin Day, uh, the Head of Engineering at Data Theorem. Alvin? Thanks, Richard. Hey, everyone. I'm Alvin, Head of Engineering at Data Theorem. And one question I always ask myself is, are we missing out on the data stack? Is there something we should be using uh, that would make uh, our product better, or maybe it would make it more secure, or it would you know, improve the uh, indigenous quality of life? Is there some kind of tech that we should be using and we're not using right now? Um, and of course, these days we hear a lot about serverless and container. Uh, and there's a lot of products, you can see some of them here, uh, AWS Lambda, uh, Kubernetes. There's a lot of uh, product and options that give you access to uh, some kind of serverless uh, stack or container-based stack orchestration. Um, and so, as you know, I'm asking myself this question, should we be using this new tech? Another factor is uh, just you know, us looking at our cloud bill. This is our Google Cloud bill for one of our projects. Uh, and you know, as the scale is going up, which is a good thing for us, the cost is also increasing. And this is one of our projects. It's a small project, as you can see, but the trend is that the cost was multiplied by five. So another aspect of this whole uh, discussion is, okay, which, if we start using the data stack, will also will it help us driving the cost down? So it's another kind of question that's always in my head and in the head of any engineer, right? And so what we decided to do to kind of try that is just build a new microservice, something we needed for one of our products, using both a serverless architecture and then a container architecture. Uh, and this was done as an experiment to kind of uh, yeah try both approaches, see uh, how, how things go, how it goes, and then, you know, here in this presentation, I'll summarize some of the key takeaways, some of the things we discover, uh, and then at the end, of course, a conclusion with kind of the lessons learned uh, as we're well, doing this experiment, running this experiment. So, of course, you know, one of the first ones to look at serverless and container, there's a lot of uh, articles and data online that you can find. Usually, the, the overall consensus around whether you should be using containers or if you should be using serverless is that uh, you know you should choose containers and container orchestrators when you need more flexibility and when you need to migrate legacy services that are not in the cloud. You know, um, and you should you should choose serverless when you need speed of development, speed of iteration. Uh, automatic scaling, and also lower runtime costs, uh, lower costs, essentially. So that's kind of what you read and hear when it comes to uh, container and serverless. And so our experiment was also to try to confirm or inform some of these, some of these things. Um, of course, when you do you know, that kind of experimental benchmark, it's always for specific use case, right? Uh, it, it doesn't always apply to every possible use case or scenario. So, our use case was essentially the new microservice we needed for one of our products, which is called Brand Protect, and some of you might be using it. Uh, what this product does uh, is it tries to find uh, cloned versions of your mobile application on third party stores. So, you know, when you put a mobile application, Android or iOS, when you put it on the Apple Store, or the Google Store, what ends up happening is that it, then it makes kind of its way to other stores that are not the official ones. And the screenshot here is an example of a Chinese app store. Um, and so when you search for Instagram on the Chinese app store, you do find some Instagram applications, but they're definitely not 
if they were not uploaded by Instagram. And they might be different. Yeah, it's probably not the real application. Um, and so that's what we wanted to do. What we ended up needing in terms of microservice was that one, one, one way, one thing we do also is we try to take these applications down, these uh, front-end applications. Um, and one way to do that is to just kind of ask the store uh, kind of nicely. Uh, and sometimes it, it actually works, right? And when you want to ask the store to take down an application, what you need to do is send an, an email and provide evidence uh, that this app is not, should not be there, uh, doesn't, wasn't uploaded there by the application owners. One piece of evidence you need to send is a screenshot of the page. So if you look on the right, on that screenshot on the right, uh, that's a screenshot of the, the Instagram application on the Chinese app store. And that's one thing you need to send uh, as part of a takedown request. So we needed a new microservice to essentially browse to an app URL, like the one we're looking at, take a screenshot, uh, and then store the screenshot somewhere so we can later use it to when we send these emails to take applications down. And of course, you know, we needed something that scales pretty well. So, uh, you know, scalability was also a, a, a key criteria. Um, and so, as I said, we uh, took Two, we tried two approaches, two architectures. The first one was serverless. Um, so this is a high-level overview of the architecture. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but essentially uh, the flow is the following. On the left, uh, the service receives URL that it needs to browse to and take a screenshot of. Um, and then in the middle, you can see a Google Cloud function. So Google Cloud function is the offering uh, it's, it's Google's offering for serverless on Google Cloud. It's the same as AWS Lambda on AWS or Azure Functions. Uh, that's the one. You get, that's the serverless product you have on Google Cloud. So Google Cloud Function. Um, and so what the function needs to do is browse to the URL and then take a screenshot and then save the screenshot uh, to Google Cloud Storage, which is similar to AWS S3. It's just a service to store files. And then once it's all done, just publish results to a queue uh, so that you know, whatever service needs these results will be notified so that the screenshots are ready. Um, so that's kind of the high-level overview uh, of the service architecture. And overall, uh, I mean, all, some of the key takeaways already as we were doing it is the whole thing takes about two minutes to, to deploy every component. Um, and the code you need to write to configure these things and to deploy them is about 20 lines of code. So it's, it's very it's pretty simple, actually. Very simple, very easy to, to get started. Um, and then as I was saying, we also decided to, to build the same microservice but more using a kind of a container architecture. Um, and on Google Cloud, um, one of the products for that, the, the container orchestration product, is Google Kubernetes Engine. Um, Kubernetes being, you know, the container orchestration tool that's developed by Google. Um, so if you look at the architecture, it's kind of similar. So on the left, you get we send URLs that we need to take a screenshot of, and then it goes through some containers that are going to also browse to the URL and take a screenshot, uh, and then it's going to save the screenshot to a, essentially a virtual hard drive, shut the system volume, and then publish the results to a queue, in this case, it will be a Redis queue. Um, and when you when you build this uh, and set it up, it takes about 10 minutes to deploy. So it's five times more than serverless. And it's about 200 lines of code for the deployment, but also all the YAML files that you need to uh, configure each of the nodes and the containers. So it's 10 times more than um, serverless for, for this architecture. Um, so these are the kind of the two approaches we took, and that's what we started kind of comparing in order to, for us to decide, you know, as as data storage internally, which approach do we want to choose for, you know, the final uh, kind of production picture. And as we did this initial work of uh, this initial architecture, the first takeaways, uh, and you kind of saw them, you know, uh, the serverless one on the left, Google Cloud function, was very easy to design and deploy. Extremely simple. We didn't need to know a lot about uh, really anything. It was really all about the code itself that takes the screenshot, 
uh, but in terms of infrastructure or in configuration, there was not much we needed to do. Um, so it was very easy to, to get started. Um, of course, the, the, the downside uh, is it was a total vendor lock-in. So every component we saw uh, in that architecture is a Google Cloud product. So you can't just take that architecture and move it to another cloud. It's very, very uh, tied to Google Cloud. So the overall impression was, okay, it, it allows you to build a prototype, which is pretty fast, but that prototype can kind of last for a long time. It can scale. Uh, it, it can be used as part of your you know, product for, for a long time. It's not something you build quickly and then you can have to get rid of. Uh, you, you can keep it for a while. Uh, on the other side, so the, the container approach with Google Kubernetes engine on the right, uh, initially we were kind of overwhelmed by how many options we had, how many things we could customize and tweak. So it's kind of impressive. Uh, you know, you control every single container, every VM, how much RAM, how much disk space, all these things, the network layout. So uh, it was impressive, but also been very flexible, but also kind of overwhelming. And it required, work, required us to do a lot more initial work to figure out, you know, how to architect it and uh, how, you know, this whole thing is going to work. So there's a much higher technical barrier to, to entry, for sure. But on the other side, there was, there was no, absolutely no vendor lock-in. So if you look at this architecture, none of this is specific to, to Google Cloud. That's Kubernetes engine, but every node uh, or container or, or component is not specific to Google. So you can put it somewhere else in a different cloud. Um, so these were the initial, kind of the initial, like kind of obvious, or I guess first impression when we started using this product. Um, and then we, we wanted to do, of course, you know, a more like in-depth analysis with like a real use case. Um, and so what, what we ended up doing to, to test these two architectures, um, we built a test, case, a test case for, you know, essentially doing 200,000 screenshots per day, um, 200,000 screenshot taking tasks per day, uh, so that we could, again, compare these two architectures in like more of a real world scenario. Um, and just some quick details about, you know, how, how this all worked. So each task, which is, you know, taking a screenshot of a page, it's memory intensive because you have to run Chrome, head as Chrome, a browser, so that takes a lot of memory. Um, because it takes a lot of memory, we had to design our architectures, um, you know, to, to allow for that. So for the serverless architecture, we only run one task per function. Um, and for the container architecture, only one task per container. So essentially, uh, to allow us to to have enough RAM to just run the browser and take a screenshot. Uh, another kind of uh, important point here is that we spread the workload through throughout the day. Uh, so essentially, we would send a, you know a couple thousand tasks every hour, um, more than a couple, maybe five thousand tasks every hour. Uh, throughout the day, instead of you know having a big spike of you know work that needs to be done and then nothing, um, we did it to keep the average utilization of the container cluster to a high enough number. Otherwise, you you, you know when there's a spike, the container is working full time, and once all all the work is done, uh, the container is just running idle. So we wanted to spread that workload so it's more a better comparison. Um, and also, this is really background processing. There's no real-time needs. We don't need to have your screenshot, you know, ready as soon as possible. We, we can wait. Uh, so because it's a background processing task, uh, it's fine to spread the workload throughout the day. And for a lot of background tasks, uh, that these kinds of assumptions are fine. Um, so that's that's kind of the, uh, the what, what we the experiment we ran. Um, and so the first thing we looked at was scaling. Um, and so on the left, uh, Google Cloud functions to the service architecture. Of course, a big thing with service is that it scales down to zero instances, so you don't pay for anything. Nothing's going on when there's no work to do. Uh, and it scales very quickly when there is work to do, so you don't need to manage the scaling at first. However, the, the problem we run into were that after a certain scale, uh, meaning you know when you have a lot of tasks happening, a lot of work happening concurrently, uh, things start breaking down. 
One other reason is that uh, the, what I call the real world, uh, it doesn't scale like serverless. So by default, a Google Cloud function will scale up to 1,000 instances. So you can do 1,000 tasks concurrently at the same time. But if your function is, you know, talking to an external server or API or database, that external thing probably doesn't scale like serverless. Uh, if you're talking to a database, it's unlikely that the database can handle 1,000 connections at the same time. Uh, and in our case, if we're accessing a website, uh, you know, having 1,000 functions crawling that website can start to look like DOS, right? <laughs> Uh, so uh, the mail service, which is not the point, it's not what I'm trying to do, but that's kind of what it looks like. So we ended up, you know, realizing that even if the scaling is supposed to be simple with, with serverless, after a certain scale, you have to manage it because, again, other things don't scale like serverless. Uh, and then there's another thing that's specific to work out, which is code ads, where if you start doing a lot of work with a lot of functions, you hit hard code ads that, you know, well, your, your function just stops working. So you also have to handle that. So overall, the overall point here is that you do need to manage things at all when you're doing serverless. The scaling, does, it, it's for free at the beginning. It's very easy at the beginning, but after a certain scale, you have to do uh, a lot more work to manage it. Um, on the right, with uh, you know, the container architecture and Kubernetes engine, um, so some VM is always running, like the, the baseline uh, cluster is running, and then you can scale up or down, but there's always something running. Uh, figuring out the scaling took a lot more work. Like we needed to really come up with numbers, number of number of VMs and RAM and all these things. But we had also a lot more controls of, uh, and options on how it should scale. Uh, and because you have to come up with all these numbers beforehand, uh, the cost is predictable. You, you know, you know how much it's going to scale. You, you kind of have to put a limit on that, uh, so you know exactly how much it's going to cost, which which was nice. Um, and then the other thing we, we realized with Kubernetes Engine is uh, you have to deploy specific applications or containers just to uh, help with the scaling. So it's essentially adapter that can measure how busy the cluster is or how much work there is to do. And just having that also use resources uh, as other containers you have to deploy. Um, so essentially managing the scaling requires using resources and then doing a lot more work at the beginning. Um, in terms of cost, uh, the results were pretty surprising to us because the service approach was 10 times more expensive than uh, the container approach. Uh, that's a screenshot of the Google Cloud bill. Uh, and so, yeah, for Google Cloud function, we ended up paying about $20 for a day. Um, and for the container architecture, it was more like $2. So it's a huge difference. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about it at, at the end. Um, in terms of security, uh, and that's kind of a well-known thing, but we definitely saw that as we were building the, that microservice. Uh, if you just look really quickly at this uh, diagram, right, it's pretty obvious that on the left with serverless, uh, you know, you only need to worry about the application code. Only your application code needs to be secure, uh, and some plumbing, you know, to decide when the function is triggered and where to send the result, but uh, other than that, the infrastructure is all taken care of by the cloud provider, in this case Google Cloud, but uh, same with, with AWS and Lambda. So the only concern is the application code. Um, on the other side, uh, with containers, uh, if you just kind of look at the documentation and just Google particles, there's a million articles about how to harden your cluster security. And a lot of them are pretty long, uh, pretty detailed, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, and so essentially, there's a lot of complexity because you have to uh, not only manage, the, you know, make sure the application code is secure, like serverless, uh, but there's also a lot of other things. Uh, you know, the container images, so which OSs and images you're pulling from uh, for, to run on, on Docker, uh, if they have, you know, vulnerabilities, then that's also your problem. And so you have to make sure you're constantly updating your images. and. Uh, making sure they are essentially secure. Um, the cluster network is essentially how you're going to design your network between all the nodes and how, how they're going to uh, communicate with each other. Uh, I mean, that needs, probably needs to be encrypted, needs to be TLS uh, or something similar. 
So that's also something you need to figure out. And then the nodes themselves, uh, the VMs that are running, making sure that as they're running, so at runtime, you know, they're secure, there's no uh, way for an attacker to kind of take advantage of them. The one thing you don't have to uh, worry about with Google Kubernetes Engine is the container runtime. So essentially, Kubernetes uh, is kept up to date by Google uh, as part of that product. But still, you have all these other things you need to do well and you need to be careful with because uh, they have a huge impact on security. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, you know, after, after running that, that little experiment, um, and based on what I just talked about, in terms of ease of use, um, it was much, much easier to get started and deploy something that works with, Google, with serverless and Google Cloud Functions. Uh, for the container one with, with Google Kubernetes Engine, uh, we had to do a lot more initial work to figure it out and deploy it and make sure it works. So ease of use is clearly uh, serverless. Uh, and that kind of confirms what, what you read online and what you know, uh, experts say. Scalability, honestly, both approaches had some uh, things that were good and some things that were bad. For me, the, the biggest takeaway with, with scaling is that with serverless, after a specific, a certain scale, you still have to manage the scaling. It's not auto-managed by Google because you start running into problems. Uh, things not scaling as well or could have and a lot of things. So the promise of not having to deal with scale, scaling is not, uh, wasn't verified for us, at least in all these cases with serverless. With Kubernetes Engine, uh, you have to do a lot more work as well to figure out how your thing is going to scale, but uh, for us, it wasn't that bad, and uh, having these options and knowing how much it's going to cost was uh, definitely a plus. In terms of cost, I mean, obviously, you, you saw it, uh, the cost was 10 times more with serverless and Google Cloud Functions. Uh, so, obviously, the, the winner here clearly, in terms of direct cost, meaning your cloud bill, uh, it's the container approach. For security, it's clearly serverless. Uh, we had so little work to do to make sure our serverless architecture was, was secure, really just making sure the input and the output are secure. So the way your function is triggered has to be secure, and that's pretty much it, right? With containers, there's a lot of things you need to uh, manage and, and you know, figure out and, uh, and make secure. It's a lot more work. And then the last one, time to market, which is kind of a, I guess it's kind of a, a summary of all these other criteria which is how quickly can you release something that works and that will work in the you know, medium and even maybe long term, uh, but needs to be done quickly in the short term. And serverless is definitely the winner here. I mean, it's very quick to get started, very easy to deploy. It will scale up and work for a long time, so it's the clear winner here. Well, the container one, you need to do, again, more architecture and work at the beginning before you can just start playing with it. Um, so that's kind of the summary for our use case. So uh, now, as I was saying, so we were doing that experiment to figure out what we should do ourselves as data theorem with this new microservice. And uh, we ended up choosing the serverless implementation, the cloud function implementation. Uh, this was because it was too convenient, <laughs> uh, you know, very easy to secure, very easy to expand it, deploy it, iterate. Uh, so it's essentially too convenient to not use that, also the cost was 10 times more, as we saw. Uh, but you know, as a startup, we need to get things out quickly. Uh, we need to get customers to start using them, right? So it just made sense for us to, to, to use you know, the serverless approach. Um, but because of you know, what we kind of discovered with the cost, uh, it did, you know, change our minds regarding whether we should use Kubernetes engine at all or not. Uh, and for some of our projects, at some point, we will probably at least consider switching to a container um, architecture with Kubernetes engine if the cost gets really, really high. Um, because clearly, it was a lot cheaper than serverless. Um, of course, we have to be careful because. When I, what I was talking about was the cost on the GCP bill, right? But then with containers, there's hidden costs, right? Uh, you probably need an engineer 
to manage it, manage the cluster, configure it, uh, do some maintenance, you know, tweak the scaling. There's a lot of more additional things you need to do to, to have it work correctly. Uh, and these are more like hidden costs around hiring um, and just overall work to, to uh, maintain. And also, if we ever switch to JKE, it will require full React staking <laughs> because uh, because you kind of have to, to 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 design things so they will kind of work well when running as containers. Um, and that's it for the conclusion. Uh, and I'll let Richard take the lead for the Q and A. Yeah, thank you, Alvin. Um, so we do have a few questions. Um, one I can answer up front is for today's. Um, uh, example or use case, we did use uh, Google Cloud Functions. Obviously, we're looking at a uh, longer term to look at um, some of the comparisons between Amazon uh, Web Services and Azure as well. Um, but for today, we did cover Google. Um, but one of the other questions that we had from the audience, Alvin, is can you expand on the large difference in price in your example between serverless and containers? Yeah. Um, and just to jump over to something you mentioned before, it would be very interesting to, for us to compare the prices with also Lambda and Azure, and it's something we'll probably do at some point. Um, now back to your question. So the difference in cost uh, we had, we saw between uh, serverless and container, which was 10x, right? $2 versus $20. Um, so there's a few things. Uh, you know, one is we're running a browser, so you need a lot of memory. So you had to set up uh, we had to configure our cloud function to have a lot of memory, so that increases the cost. But at the same time, the container architecture also was using a lot of memory. So I would say overall the cost was high because of the memory needs. But the difference between uh, cloud function and container, the 10x difference, honestly, there's probably a few things we could do to try to drive the cost down with serverless. Maybe try to run functions with less RAM. Um, I'll, I'll try to do more tasks using just one function. Um, but I think you, you, at the end of the day, you just pay for convenience, right? So, uh, you know, even though you, it's pay per use with cloud function and serverless, uh, in all use case, you know, it's background processing. So there's a lot of things to do throughout the day. Uh, and a lot of use cases around background processing are like that. Uh, it, it, you just pay for convenience, you know, as I was saying, how easy it is to get started and deploy and iterate. Um, and so I think we, if with some optimization, we would be able to drive the cost down, but then you end up, you know, doing all these tweaks and optimizations, which are things you don't really want to deal with when you're using serverless. You know, one of the whole point of serverless is you don't have to manage infrastructure and how much RAM and all these things. So I think we, we would be able to drive the cost down, but it's clearly going to be cheaper to use uh, Kubernetes engine for, for that use case. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, Alvin. So we have uh, another question to the audience. What are your thoughts on complexity, security, and security for AKS type of managed container services where customers manage only containers but not worker nodes or master nodes? Mainly differences in using serverless architecture versus managed containers like AKS for Azure or IKS for IBM. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so, so as I was saying, for serverless, one thing I like a lot about it is uh, there's not much you need to do to be secure. You can always make big mistakes, like in finding things, but uh, overall, by design, by default, even it's going to be kind of secure. Um, so for AKS type of managed container, um, so I think I would guess the concern has to do around. Um, I guess the question is about if you're running your own cloud environment and you have customers using your containers. Um, you know, if that's if that's the case, I would say to me it sounds pretty difficult to secure, you know, uh, a container that's under the control of your customers who, who might be you know the attacker in that case. Um, securing the container so that it cannot be used to you know uh, attack the rest of the infrastructure. Uh, is, I mean, that's essentially what Google, Amazon, and Microsoft are doing with their cloud environments. So I think it takes a lot of uh, expertise. It's really not, it doesn't, I'm not an expert into that specific field, but uh, it, as a security person, it sounds very difficult to secure, and you need uh, a security team that's the size of the Google Cloud or Amazon 
uh, security team. Because once you give that level of access to a container, uh, preventing that container from, from being abused to, to you know, affect the system and the architecture, that's really tough. Yeah. Uh, hopefully that was the, <laughs> that, that answers the question. Uh, thank you, Alvin. So um, just given our time, I think that's all the, the questions we have from the audience. So we'll go ahead and uh, wrap up there. For those of you who would like to kind of continue the conversation with us, uh, feel free to sign up for a demo at datatherum.com slash demo, and we'll be sure to follow up with you and continue the discussion. Thank you again, everyone, for your time today, and we will be sending out a request.